Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Country Roads, sub slash x slash. Who wants to hear the stories from growing up in ass nowhere, West Virginia? I got some good ones, but I don't feel like wasting them if nobody's going to read them. Late 90s, probably 97 or 98. Spring, early summer. I'm 9 or 10 years old. I live in a huge old farmhouse with my mom, dad, two sisters, brother, and great uncle. Not a mansion by any means. Just built onto many times over the years by successive generations. This isn't really important for this story, but is for other ones. Decent-sized fields out front and to the west of the house. East is woods for miles and miles. Spend most of my time as a kid playing around in the woods with my siblings. We're pretty close to each other in age, and two kids who live down the road. One day it's all of us minus my oldest sister in the woods in a teepee we made. Bored as all hell. The neighbor kids have a cousin who's known as a delinquent. He tells them there's a witch who lives in the woods. We all worship this guy so we believe him without question. We're normally too scared to do anything like this, but we're so bored. None of us have a TV or anything like that because we're poor and parents are convinced it rots the brain. We go out looking for a witch hut, despite none of us knowing where to look or even what it looks like. Start in mid-afternoon. We all know the woods pretty well so we can go fairly deep without getting lost. A few hours in, we find an old cabin. Like 70 years old, this thing could have housed Abe Lincoln. Covered in rocks and rotting wood absolutely decrepit. Of course we try to go in. It's locked. My older brother doesn't want to seem like a coward, so he kicks down the door. It practically disintegrates. First thing we notice is the smell. Jesus Christ Almighty, this cabin is shit. The second thing we notice is the huge hole under the wall. Four feet across, two feet tall, deeper than we can see because it's dark out. The third thing we notice is the food. Everywhere there's food. Apples, vegetables, meat, burgers, chips, carrots, eggs, Bread rolls, everything you could buy in a 10 mile radius and everything rotting and covered in mold. Maybe a couple dead animals, but they're just rats and birds and shit, so who cares? The food has mushrooms growing out of it. Everything has mushrooms growing out of it. Can't see through the windows because a solid wall of fungus has grown nearly covering the wall. There might have been furniture here at one point, but all has submitted to the almighty fungoid force. Down the tunnel is fungus too. There's nothing to see here and we're all grossed out so we leave. As we're debating whether or not this is the witch hut, we notice that there is a trail of assorted mushrooms like pick related, except instead of artfully arranged, they're dirty, mostly brown and smell like shit. We follow the trail. It's coming out of the same side of the house as the hole. These woods are thick so it gets hard to follow after a while, and eventually impossible after they seem to end at a cliff. We turned back. Disappointed we didn't see the witch, but more afraid of this obviously unnatural fungus. As we turn back, we follow the mushroom trail again, but we don't recognize any of the surroundings. We start freaking out, but my older brother calms us down. Eventually, the mushroom trail reaches a pond. What the hell? This isn't a cabin. It's dark. We're all pissing ourselves. We turn back the other way and figure we'll eventually get to a road. After a while, we see another trail of fungus. We figured we followed the wrong trail before, and this will lead us back to the cabin, so we follow it. After a while, we notice the fungus has started to glow, but some mushrooms do that, so we don't think much of it. A few minutes later, it's glowing really brightly. The farther we follow it, the brighter it gets. Eventually, it leads into a thicket. Wrong way again. The younger neighbor kid starts crying. Everyone tries to shut him up, could be wild animals, but he keeps crying, and the mushrooms stop glowing, and he's trying to run away. Wait what, Dodexa? The mushrooms stopped glowing. Nobody can see at all. We see a glow coming from behind some trees. Our stupid selves thought it was a lamp from a house or something. We all collectively sigh. Immediately, something walks out of the trees. Sister starts screaming. It looks like a really tall man with the face of a dog with a vague smile. No eyes. It's made of mushrooms. Imagine the clickers from The Last of Us, but with a dog-like face coming out of the crown. It's glowing faintly and lurching towards us. We all start blindly running. 
We pass a tree we've all seen before, and after a few minutes of running we stop because it looks like it's gone. Leaning back against a tree and it caves. What in God's name? It's just hundreds of brown mushroom stalks winding together. Not even five feet behind the fallen tree is the thing we were running from. We booked it again, way faster this time. Older brother has to carry the younger neighbor kid who's just screaming and wailing. We see the cabin, so we know where we are. Except now the cabin seems to be made of mushrooms and glowing faintly. The rocks we thought we saw have opened up and are now huge black mushrooms with green undersides two more minutes of racing for our lives, and we come out in a completely unfamiliar field. There's a house. We run to the porch, bawling our eyes out. The owners come to the door. They're distant family. They live 15 miles in the opposite direction that we were walking all day. It's 10 p.m. and our parents have apparently been freaking out, calling the police, fire department, whoever. We get home at 11 p.m. We're still crying. We tell our parents what happened, but they chalk up the crying to the beating they're giving us and the story is a lie. Won't go in the woods until next year and never see that cabin again. Still psyched out by mushrooms. So what I can figure out is that some mushroom spirit or something was trying to lure us into the middle of the woods and kill us, which it damn near did. There have apparently been stories of nearby abandoned buildings being totally consumed by mushrooms, but I never took any interest in those stories because I had no desire to see Mr. Mushroom Dog again. The neighbor's cousin, I'll call him Andy, was responsible for a lot of stupid shit we all ended up doing, and the younger neighbor kid ended up screwing us over multiple times. His name was Preston. I have other stories, but that was the most scarring one that happened to me personally. Pick related for the mushroom monster. I'm a shitty artist, but that's nearly the exact expression he was making. So for the other stories I got, rat sellers, a few generic skinwalker stories, a couple caving stories all by Andy, KKK ghosts, family ghosts, freakers, the behemoth, I know it's spelled wrong, Town Crusades, related to Freakers. Those last three happened well before I was born, so some details are shady and probably exaggerated. Okay, I'll start with the last three. These are town lore, so most of them were told to me by Andy and my old relatives. Town Crusades is first, so the area of West Virginia my family lived in was first settled by some pioneers in the early 1700s. These pioneers settled down to live a nearly uninterrupted life in a utopian woodlands farming society. Most history books leave these people out because they were not very relevant and not many people know about them, seeing as they left nearly no trace except oral tradition. They came from all over the 13 colonies, some from England and a few Irishmen. They called themselves the Christian Brotherhood of Arboreal Serenity, or some cultish shit like that, but for the most part they were just proto-Amish. Now these guys were all Christians, Protestant, but then some Welsh immigrants came along and settled in the same area. They were from the western part of Wales, where the old traditions had lived on up until the 16th century, and these are the people I descended from. However, most of these people were Christian anyway, and only one was actually versed in Celtic practices. I mean, maybe there were more, but he's the important one. So this guy's name was Evan Richards, son of Richard. He was Christian by description but in practice he had no similarity to any Christian beliefs. He worshipped Jesus, but as the child of a father god and a mother god, with a couple other gods sprinkled in, and he was convinced he was the only true Christian around. So basically he was a heretic. I don't really understand how he got in with the Brotherhood, but as soon as they settled down, he started causing problems. Like they had their own church, but he founded another one and got a few people on his side convincing them that he was some kind of prophet. It started off fairly benign, with him keeping out of the other's way, but once they tried to kick him out, it got heated. He was excommunicated and then tried and jailed. These were hardline Puritans, so dissent was not an option. While he was in jail, he said he had seen the light and renounced his ways, so he was allowed to walk free, but he began holding services again in secret. These services attracted more and more people, and as the group grew, so did his mythology. There were rituals and myths and lots of other weird shit, but for some reason one theme that held out was pigs. Pigs were slaughtered, pampered, eaten, danced with, rode around on, and what David Cameron was falsely accused of, 
This guy was clearly batshit. He raised dozens of pigs on his farm, allowing them to live with him at his house, which was growing really sizable crops much faster than all of his neighbors. People saw this and decided to join his religion in hopes their own crops would turn out better. Eventually, the split between the Brotherhood and the heretics was about 50 fiftieths. The leaders of the community had to take action. They said anyone who was found with pigs in their houses would be tried and executed. Then something weird happened. As the mobs of angry Brotherhood members began to search the heretics' homes, there were no pigs, not even any on the farms. But there were more people in the heretics' houses than there had been before. That night, most of the heretics, including Evan Richards, were killed, and the rest fled. Hundreds of years passed, and the actual facts of the stories were changed and exaggerated, with the heretics and pig people used to scare children into submission. The Brotherhood faded into obscurity as Methodists flooded the area, eventually being forgotten altogether, except as the people who drove out the heretics. However, the collective consciousness remembered the heretics and were quite afraid of people who were Welsh and acted funny. It was in the 1900s decade that the Brotherhood made a comeback. Although they presented themselves as a political party, nativist, white power, anti-Irish, etc. This was when my great-grandma was growing up, so she was frequently harassed by these neo-brothers and told my great-uncle, her son, about this later in life. They were led by an old guy named Hezekiah or something, and they were kind of like a localized clan. They were also anti-Welsh, and I think they only called themselves the Brotherhood because they wanted to scare people into thinking the heretics were back. This had the opposite reaction that they intended. The heretics, who had fled two centuries ago to who knows where and apparently died out, suddenly became the talk of the town again. People reported hearing pigs squealing in the night, cultish services were apparently being held in secret, and normally reasonable people gave in to hysteria. Then one day, I doubt most of this actually happened, but this is what I was told. The heretics just up and started operating again, holding services, sacrificing pigs, crops growing to huge sizes, the whole nine yards. At this point, it was make or break for the new brotherhood. They took power over the local governments and sheriff's offices and ordered all heretics to leave or die. The heretics did not take well to this. They called down curses on the neo-brotherhood and sure enough, Hezekiah, or whatever his name was, fell ill and died. Local militias were formed to go against the heretics, but since they had no way of knowing who ran the operation, they targeted everyone connected. The heretics were furious and immediately called a counterattack, literally marching into towns and going after the brothers. These heretics had considerably more forces than what was accounted for, though. So these newcomers were originally attributed to recruits from other areas, but they just kept coming, and that's when people began to realize the majority of the heretics' newfound army was really fucking stupid. The stupid ones got the name Freakers eventually, and they just kept coming. There were at least 50 of them. They looked like people, and didn't really hurt anyone who weren't brothers, but they were extremely unsettling, and towns they visited emptied out quickly. In a week, all but a few of the brothers had been killed. The ones who were still around got a couple of the non-Freakers to talk, and set fire to the huge wooden complex that the important people in the heretics organization had been based out of. The freakers weren't heard of much after that, although every so often reports come up of mute and special people showing up in towns. My great uncle told me about how he killed 10 freakers himself, but obviously that's bullshit. I'll talk about the behemoth next, since that was another cool story by my great uncle. My great uncle, I'll call him Jim, and my grandpa were best friends since they were little kids on account of them being twins, identical, and spending nearly every day of their lives together until they were 18. It was the 50s and tensions were high in Tucker County. After the coal mines that had opened near the surface after the huge fires in the 1910s, look this up, it's weird, had mostly dried up, larger coal conglomerates moved in to take advantage of the area's natural resources and make deeper coal mines. Nobody local could really do this due to the lack of industrial drilling technology. So Jim and my grandpa went to work in one of these new super deep coal mines. Now keep in mind, the Appalachian Mountains are some of the oldest mountains on Earth and have existed for 500 million years. 
they had been more or less undrilled until these large companies came in. While it was profitable enough, and my grandpa and Jim finally found a steady job, the mountains themselves didn't seem to like it. Jim tells me it was about 1953 when things started happening. First it was just a couple cave-ins, but then the canaries started dying almost immediately after entering the mines. Birds and small animals around the entrances would drop dead frequently, and silicosis cases skyrocketed. But the nation needed coal, and 500 million years worth of compressed carbon-based life could power anything. So mining continued, until it couldn't one day when the largest shearer, a big saw used to actually obtain the coal, was found shattered. This was attributed to a sudden decrease in temperature. People thought the fanning system used to circulate oxygen had malfunctioned. But until the shearer was fixed, the mining had to stop. After two weeks, the pay the workers were receiving had dried up, and my grandpa and Jim decided to take things into their own hands. With six other men in tow, they descended into the mine under the guise that they were mechanics hired to fix the shearer. Once they got down to the lowest level, it was chaos. The crow they had brought in, smaller birds died quickly, was cawing uncontrollably, and not only was the shearer shattered, conveyor belts were ripped to shreds, huge holes were made in the walls, floor, and roof of the tunnels, and machinery was broken. This could not have been the work of a malfunctioning fan system, obviously. The party leaves the mine and comes back a day later with pickaxes and guns and other shit that could end up being useful in figuring out, getting rid of what was doing this to the equipment. However, on the way down, the elevator got stuck a few feet short of the entrance to the lowest level. Climbing out, the group noticed the elevator shaft was blocked off with huge rocks. Nearly all the lights were off and broken, and the equipment was even further mangled. Noticing a set of human footprints, the group began to follow them to figure out how these hooligans could have possibly gotten in, when someone pointed out their own boots were making much shallower indentations in the rocky mud. It was at that point when they realized that no common delinquent could have possibly lifted huge rocks, torn up conveyor belts, and broken a shearer weighing hundreds of pounds, and that there were larger handprints to the side of the tunnel, outside the range of their lamps. Something large and inhuman was in the mine. They turned back to return to the surface, afraid of whatever was in there with them. But as they ran, the tunnel began to shake, and four of the men jumped back as a wall of rocks and gravel fell from the roof, separating them from two others, plus Jim and my grandpa. One of them had his leg seriously injured under a large rock, and he had to be carried by the other three around to where another tunnel led to the now blocked off area. In that tunnel, which was longer than most of the others, strip mines led to narrow areas, one of which apparently led out to a crack through which the group could reach the trapped men. While entering this tunnel, one of the men became aware of a low rumbling, gradually increasing in volume. Thinking it was another cave-in, they quickly moved away from the source back towards the elevator, but it seemed to be following them. And just then, something huge white and hairy bolts around a corner and charges them, the three uninjured men whip out their guns, and five seconds later, the thing is dead. It had the opposable thumbs of a human, but that's where its similarities with any kind of ape ended, looking more like a huge bear than anything. It had two deformed eyes that took up almost half its face, and it was clearly some kind of mutant, because it was covered in bony, tumorous growths. It was at least ten feet tall, and its canine teeth were a foot long each. Its fur was patchy and light gray, and its pupils were reddish like an albino. All of its limbs were disproportionately long and stocky, and it seemed to rely on its arms as a second pair of legs. My grandpa and Jim, both of who were avid hunters, thought it was an incredible kill, whatever it was, and took its head and one of its arms as a prize and to present to the local police station as evidence the mine should be reopened. Over the course of a few hours, the eight men all managed to get back into the elevator and eventually returned to the surface. My grandfather and Jim showed their kill to the state police, who confiscated it as scientific evidence, which was enough to satisfy them, because they were pretty uneducated. The only evidence the thing ever existed is a black and white photo of my grandpa and Jim grinning like idiots, each holding a tusk with the behemoth written on the bottom. This first set of caves was located decently far from where I lived, but Andy's truck was good for a 45-minute drive. 
They were called the sinks, and there was a large creek that ran into them. The river runs about a mile before exiting the cave on the other side, but along that mile are multiple entrances to a mid-sized cave system in the soft limestone that is prevalent in West Virginia. Although these entrances are very difficult to access if you are larger than a child, Andy was skinny as a rail and pretty short too though, so he could fit into the first opening without trouble. This led into a decent-sized room from which you could spelunk a few pits, tunnels, etc., and it was one of his favorite pastimes. The first story goes like this. Drive from Tucker to the sinks, gets his caving shit and gets into the river entrance, and then into the crevice. Finds himself in the room, begins his descent. He's going to go sit in a small room at the bottom of one of the tunnels and read with his lamp on. He's big into reading. Gets to the bottom of the tunnel and into the room. Suddenly, grrrrch. A loud grinding and scratching sound from up the tunnel. Oh shit us dot og. Climbs back up to see if he could be losing oxygen from a fallen rock or something. There's no fallen rock. Everything is exactly how he left it up to the first room. More grrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
gonna go down anyway. To get to the basement, you used to have to go outside and through cellar doors. Now there is a staircase down to an attached shed, in which the cellar doors are located get down to the basement. Brown water everywhere, leaky pipes, it's all disgusting. The cards are located on a shelf near the stairs down, so I pick them up and go back upstairs. As I'm leaving, I notice that the dirt has been washed away in front of the shelf and there's a wood floor. I decided to investigate this after it stopped raining. Go back upstairs, play cards for like three hours. Go to bed, the next day. I get a shovel from the shed and go downstairs to the basement. To my surprise, more of the wooden floor is exposed. Begin to shovel the dirt into the corner. There's a full wooden floor about three inches underneath the dirt floor. The wood is creaky and rotting in some places due to years of water damage. Call for my brother to come see. He's just as surprised as I am, but he notices something near the back of the basement. There's a square of much lighter wood. Looking closely, you can make out a wooden hinge in the floor next to it. Holy shit, there's a trap door in the basement. Run upstairs to get a crowbar. Pry it open. It's an empty nook about two feet deep. Disappointment.jpg Brother says it was probably used to hold a safe. Close it and go back upstairs. Dad gets home from work later that evening. We tell him about the trap door and also to help us shovel the dirt back onto the floor. He comes down and looks at the little hole. There's still nothing there. But Dad says dirt looks slightly loose at the bottom of the hole. We dig a little again. Hit something solid. It's buried treasure. No, it isn't. It's dozens of rat skeletons. What the fuck dot MP4? Feel a draft and get really uneasy. Skitter upstairs. Neither of the others really care about this, so they follow me. Eat dinner. Go to bed. I'll fill it back up in the morning. That night I had a dream. Or a sleepwalking episode. Or an out-of-body experience. Or something. I find myself walking downstairs and then into the shed and then into the basement. I pick up a shovel and keep digging through the rat skeletons. I feel an intense sense of fear, but a stronger sense of curiosity and duty. I dig for some indeterminate amount of time. In this experience, my sense of time is heavily distorted. Suddenly, there's light from the dirt. I keep digging and fall onto a pile of loose dirt in a room that looks exactly like my basement. Rat skeletons litter the room. I can't climb back up, so instead I take the stairs. It's the shed attached to my house. Ignoring the obvious spatial impossibilities, the first thing I notice is that the house is completely silent. I go up the other stairs into the main part of my house, similarly silent. All of the windows are covered in dirt and it's foggy outside. I can't see anything. No one is upstairs in bed. Try to leave the house through various exits, but through these doors only lead into new additions. I eventually find one door that leads outside. I don't know how I knew it would lead outside. The environment outside is a hellscape. Imagine nowhere from Courage the Cowardly Dog. Except rats are everywhere, squeaking and screeching. My ears, which have been accustomed to silence heretofore, are assaulted. Rats as small as insects, rats as big as dogs, rats with different colored fur. As I turn to close the door, it's not there anymore. Rats begin to chase me. They come through the doorway and into my knot house. I am desperately sprinting through the house whose layout is completely unfamiliar for my basement door. The door is nowhere to be found. The house is breaking down around me, rats gaining on me. With them on my heels, I find my basement door. I leap down the stairs and up the pile of dirt. I manage to pull myself up into the real basement. I frantically shovel dirt back into the hole as rats screech loudly below. I finished shoveling. Rat squeaks die down. I close the trap door. I go back upstairs. I get back into bed. Deep sleep. The next morning I remember all of this extremely clearly. I recounted it to my brother. Oh wow, creepy dream. I don't think anything more of it. I go down to check if anything actually happened. The trap door is closed. It had been open when I left yesterday. Brother and dad say they don't remember if they closed it after I had scurried away. We recover the floor with dirt and I never go back down there while it's raining again. I really hope that was a dream. I dated a woman from West Virginia for a number of years from around the southern... Knob? Panhandle? 
Lived outside of a town where evidently the whole damn town is haunted. There's ghosts up the ass that there's a number of paranormal groups dedicated to scoping them out. She told me a couple of stories, but it's been years now. I think one of her childhood homes was haunted, if I recall correctly. Little balls of light and sometimes odd shadow people. Now that I think about it, she talked about the shadow people frequently and it was something her family experienced too. Cursed ass state. What's up, you meme-loving fucks? I noticed this thread, and as I am from Fayette County, it's in the southern part of the state, I figured I would contribute. It said that, in the 1960s, young men would never travel the roads of Blue Jay 6 in Raleigh County at night. Along the reaches of the roads, the foundations of an old house are still intact. Legend says that a young man and woman moved into the area with their infant child. One day the parents left but no one remembers seeing them take their child with them. The couple left no forwarding address or any other trace to follow. But if you stand near the foundation of the house, you can still hear the child cry three times. First there would be a loud scream, like the cry of a child being tortured. Another scream always followed. This one seemed to lose strength. As the third cry rang out, it sounded like a weakened moan, like a light going out. An elderly resident of the area said his mother told him that you could hear the sounds of a window slamming between the first and second cries. This lingering of the past came to be known as a token. My family has many tokens shared among us all, and I will share some of my favorites. I'll also share a goofy story about a supposed monster in Raleigh County. My dad was very poor when he was growing up. They didn't have any board games or things like that to play when the power went out. So my grandmother would tell stories. Here is my favorite. A distant cousin once fell seriously ill due to the stress of divorcing her abusive husband. She died unexpectedly, and her mother was inconsolable. After the funeral, the mother tried to cope with the loss of her only daughter. But each night she would have nightmares about someone drilling through her skull. She would wake up with terrible migraines. She said that it was her daughter's spirit trying to tell her that something was wrong with her grave. Everyone dismissed it all as tension, migraines, and grief. The nightmares continued for weeks until her family gave up and decided to exhume the daughter's body, hopefully putting the mother's mind at rest. Upon reaching the cemetery, the family noticed that the grave looked disturbed. After digging out the casket, they looked inside and screamed. Someone had driven an eight-inch hat pin through the daughter's skull. The family called the police. After a somewhat short investigation, the daughter's ex-husband turned himself in out of guilt. He was so angry with her for leaving him that he desecrated her corpse. Many years ago, there was a judge in Fayette County who was known for his cruelty and harsh punishments. He would give people extremely long jail sentences for the most minor of crimes. People were certain that he would go to hell. At the end of the judge's life, he became bedridden and had family look after him. One day... The judge began to scream at the top of his lungs and flail about. The devil is dancing on my chest, he's burning me. The family thought he was just delirious. They tried to soothe him as his temples poured sweat. He begged for water to put out the flames and ice to cool his body down. Not knowing how to handle the situation, the family gathered a bucket of ice and poured it on him. As quickly as the ice was poured onto his skin, it melted away. His thrashing became more and more violent, so the family called a doctor. The doctor arrived in the hopes of calming the judge down. As the doctor crossed the threshold of the judge's room, the old man screamed even louder. He said, Please don't take me. Please, I beg you. And all at once the judge fell silent and still. He was dead, taken to hell by the devil himself. I'll share a couple little short ones before I tell you about the monster. My grandmother told her kids that they should always avoid the house at the end of their road. She said a witch lived there and she was a lover to the devil. My father and two uncles went against her wishes and decided to travel down the road one day. At the end of the road stood a large white house with thick columns. The house sat on the other side of a murky creek with a wooden bridge as its only access. As my family got closer, they noticed that the bridge appeared to be moving. Upon closer inspection, they realized that it was absolutely covered in snakes, all wrapped up and writhing within each other. They all yelped and went to run away. About that time, an old woman stepped out of the house and walked towards them.
Frozen by a blend of fear and curiosity, they stayed where they were. The woman got close to the bridge, and the snakes began to part like the Red Sea. If there wasn't room for them to move apart, the snakes would throw themselves into the muddy waters below. As the snakes gave way to the old woman, partial curiosity became total fear. My father and two uncles ran as hard as their legs would carry them. They never told my grandmother about the incident. Here's another one, but really short. My great aunt was an avid tarot reader. People from all over the area would come to have their fortunes told. She started to have fewer readings as sitting for so long was hard on her very pregnant body. During her final tarot reading for the day, she started to shuffle the cards and put them away. As she shuffled, the death card fell out of the deck and landed on her stomach. Thinking nothing of it, she put the cards away and went to bed. Not long after, she went into labor and was rushed to the hospital. When the baby was delivered, it was stillborn. And now, the tale of the Fireco monster. In 1934, people in the little coal town of Fereco, Raleigh County, began to see a horrible beast the monster was said to be ten feet long and could rip heads straight from the necks of fully grown hogs. It had feet the size of a toddler's, and they were all covered in razor-sharp claws. When the monster walked, its claws would tear out chunks of earth that weighed up to 50 pounds. Its eyes sat towards the end of its nose, and its head strongly resembled that of a horse. When people would yell at the beast to scare it away, it would simply mock their voice in a haunting tone. Here is where things get kind of goofy. People became desperate to get rid of this thing. One man brought forth a fly that had been living in his house, survived the entirety of winter, and several attempts on its life. The man had placed a glue trap out to kill the fly, but the trap just stuck to its head and gave him a fancy parasol, according to local newspapers. A civic organization said they planned to release this unkillable fly to the Fireco monster in the hopes that they kill each other. Many newspaper columnists thought these were all tales of drunkards. That is, until an ear, nose, and throat specialist claimed to have caught the monster. He produced a matchbox with an earthworm inside. His theory was that under the right lighting, this worm would appear 10 feet long and monstrous. Everyone was skeptical, but no more sightings were ever reported again. Another person from West Virginia here. My brother and I saw something weird when staying at a place called Green Lakes. Not a very good storyteller. We snuck out to go night swimming and they were on a trail beside one of the lakes and ponds that you fish in. They were covered in white robes and had something white wrapped around their head. Not clan-like, almost like a turban. There was at least five of them standing in a semicircle. There's a long stretch of thin land between two lakes that you could fish in. When we got over on the stretch to see what was going on, they weren't there. We ended up not swimming, but the next day when we went fishing, there was ash and five black marble-looking things around the area we saw them in. That was the last time we had been there, and that was probably almost 13 years ago. My mother broke up with the guy that had connections to the place. What makes it weirder is that it wasn't the first time we saw someone dressed like that. We were walking on train tracks next to a river where you're not supposed to trespass. We went over the bridge that goes over an offshoot of the river and we saw a girl. We both assumed it was a girl for some reason, dressed in all white robes with a headdress. After we crossed, we looked back and she wasn't there. Yeah, she could have jumped off the bridge tracks into the water like people do, but it's still weird. W. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time. Remember to check the Odyssey and Rumble pages for separate archives of previous broadcasts.